Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the potential of uh, genome editing uh, for sustainable um, agriculture. And I'll give an example uh, from my work in, in bananas. So let me just briefly tell you about my institute. So it is International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, IITA, is uh, one of the one CGIR uh, research centers. And the IITA is uh, founded in 1967, um, and then its headquarter is in Nigeria. It is one of the world's leading research partner, finding solutions for hunger, uh, malnutrition, and, and poverty. And we are, we, our focus is actually sub-Saharan Africa, and we have delivered more than 70% of the CGIR's impact in that region. And for that reason, IATA received um, 2018 Africa Food Prize for Research Leadership and Innovation. So we operate, uh, we are actually in more than 22 countries, and we operate with hub. So we have hub for Western Africa, for Central, for Eastern, and for Southern Southern Africa. We mainly work on banana plantain, cassava, cowpea, maize, soybean, and yam. And uh, we have more than actually currently like more than 250 international um, scientists um, and, and uh, working with a lot of different uh, uh, projects. So this is something to show you like, you know, where how my lab look like. So this is actually basically uh, where our uh, transgenic and genome editing work is based. So we are hosted at BECA, which is Biosciences for Eastern and Central Africa, um, ILRI hub. And uh, so these are the glass houses and some pictures from inside, inside the labs. Um, so, okay, as you know that, you know, uh, the major global challenges in agriculture right now is uh, food security. Um, over a billion people go hungry every day. And, and then it's still the world population is increasing. It's projected to be about 9.8 billion by 250. But when we come to Africa, actually the, the population is like, as you can see, is projected to be double by 2050. So that means that, you know, we need to get the agriculture production maybe double. Uh, but the resources are limited. We have the same resources, so we cannot increase the resources. And then, and on the top of that, climate change uh, is again intensifying that challenge. We already started seeing um, the extreme climate has harmful influences, not only on plants, but as well as on pathogens and pests, which affect the crop crop productivity. So, so what we need is like, you know, we, we need for the more sustainable um, agriculture because there is a need to close the yield gap in most of the staple uh, food crops in, in order to enhance the, the food production. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, we have to utilize all the tools available in our toolbox, including the new breeding tools, such as, uh, as gene editing, um, uh, in addition or in complementing uh, to the conventional uh, technologies. So uh, what is gene editing? Uh, so gene editing is actually a group of technologies and that gives scientists uh, ability uh, to make some, some specific changes in the genome of an organism. And basically it is mediated by the, the plant or the animal cells using their own DNA, DNA repair uh, machinery uh, without including any foreign um, DNA. And it has been happening in the nature Anyway, so there are, uh, as I said, it is group of technologies. So there are different methods of doing genome editing, including like mega nucleases, zinc finger nucleases, uh, talents, and more recently the CRISPR uh, Cas uh, technique. So as I said, it is it is very specific and precise. So what happens is these these nucleases uh, just they make just the uh, cut in the double stranded DNA, and after that is now the 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 cell which uses its own repair machinery and then repair. And during the repair, some changes can happen. So the repair can be two types. One is the non homologous end joining, and in the in this case, you know the repair. 
um, is error prone. So that's why, you know, it can create some, some mutations, which can be small insertions or, or deletions, or sometimes like, you know, few base pairs replacement as well. The second type of repair is the homology directed repair. In this case, this is happens when there is um, a donor template is, is available. And in this case, it normally actually ends up into the, into the insertion. Uh, so, um, so as as I was saying before, genome editing, you know, it can happen in in a natural way um, as well. So it is not not new. Uh, it has been happening in the nature for very very long time. And in the past, you know, when the changes happened, and then the farmers were like, you know, selecting their varieties, and that's how they were getting the improved varieties. Uh, but in the 20th century, actually, the mutations were accelerated um, using uh, chemicals um, and the radiations. Um, so the first the chemical induced mutation in plant was reported in 1944. And before that, in 1927, it was actually the radiation induced uh, mutations in, in plant. But later on, uh, the technologies were developed to do more precise uh, uh, gene editing. Uh, because before, like when you were using chemicals or radiations, it was more like random uh, uh, mutations. Uh, so with, uh, with that, like more technologies has, has evolved, like, you know, zinc finger nucleases, but also uh, talons and, and mega nucleases. But later on, uh, uh, more recently, actually the CRISPR uh, technology has um, has been invented in 2013 and has become actually the most popular uh, genome editing uh, approach. So the CRISPR-Cas tool actually got the Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry in 2020, but it's still, it is still more evolving. So like, you know, now base editing is there, CRISPR activation and, and more recently prime editing. Um, so, um, 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 the CRISPR-Cas technology has been applied uh, uh, more successfully. If you will see, like now, most uh, many people are using CRISPR-Cas in comparison to the mega nucleases or talons or or the zinc finger nucleases, and that's mainly because it's easy to adapt and the feasibility uh, of of the uh, of the reagents. And so, it is actually, I'll say, it is now the most commonly use technology. It is very important to understand, you know, what type of genome editing, uh, uh, when, when you do the genome editing, what type of the product you will be getting, what type of mutations will, will happen, because that has the implication on the regulation. Uh, uh, of that one. So as I explained, you know, when the when these nucleases made a cut, it can go two ways. When there is no donor template available, then is a non-homologous and joining. And we call them actually the mutations generated like this, we call them SDN1. And this case is more like a small indel. So it, it can lead to the um, gene silencing or gene, gene knockout. Um, and so this SN1 is very similar to the mutations obtained through the chemical mutagenesis or irradiation or even in the spontane spontaneous um, and natural mutations. And then SDN type of mutation, uh, uh, the products with the SDN type mutations are actually not regulated as GMOs in several countries. I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later. But the second type of the uh, the, the the mutations, which are homology directed mutations, then that one is when the donor template is present. And in that case, it can be either SDN2, where it has only a small um, a mutation, but it is also like a correction because the donor template is present. So it is like copying that one. And the second type is SDN3, which actually leads to the introduction. So it can be um, the, the whole in insertion of the whole gene, or it can lead to the replacement. So depending upon whether the gene insertion, the gene is actually from the same species when it will be treated more as cisgenic, or if it is from outside of the species, then this one is actually is equivalent to the transgenic in that case. So, so it's very important to understand the SDN1, SDN2, and SDN3 type, you know, so if somebody is working with, with gene editing. Um, so plants derived from gene editing, as I explained before, it can be GM, it 
or it cannot be considered as GMOs depending upon the process of the gene editing. Um, and so what happened is uh, when, when the cut has happened, so it also depends how the reagents, the, the, the reagents for the gene editing was used, whether they have been used in a, in a plasmid form and it gets integrated into the plant genome. So even though there is a small mutation, but there is an integration of the uh, of the editing um, uh, reagents into the plant genome, then that's considered as GM. Um, but if the reagents are not integrated and also in the mutation, there is no foreign gene at all uh, because it, it is only deletion or insertion or replacement with the natural repairing of DNA strands. In that case, actually, they are exempted from as a GMO um, um, status. Okay. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, benefits of gene editing. So gene editing can be used starting from the functional genomics for the gene discovery. Uh, it can be used to enhance the nutrition with protein, vitamin, oil, starch, sugar, also for the yield improvement. Uh, then the biotech stress resistance, like resistance to pathogens like bacteria, viruses, fungi, for the abiotic stress tolerance like drought, salt, heat and cold, and also the herbicide um, at, at, at tolerance. Um, so um, for the, there are two interesting things here, which I would like to say. The first of all, more than 60% gene additive reagents used so far are actually currently are actually CRISPR Cas. The second thing which I would which I found very interesting in comparison to the transgenic, you know, if you see the GM, mainly the GM products are coming from the private sector. But if you see the gene editing, actually more projects are in the public sector in comparison to the private sector here. And there are a lot of uh, products are at at moment are actually under the early r and d stage some actually going to the um, advanced um, r and d stage and and then like very few at the commercialization so gene editing has so far been reported in more than 40 crops crop species um, across uh, 25 countries or even more, you know, because now this data is keep on changing um, every week. Um, but most of them are actually addressing the, the agronomy or the food and feed quality and, and also the biotic and the abiotic stress uh, tolerance. So uh, it's not only the gene editing is not only in theory. It's, it's like now reality. So there are some products already like non-browning non, non mushroom, which was approved in US and Canada. There is a high oleic soybean oil, which is already in the market, uh, which is actually is the first genome edited food product in the US market. Then um, if, uh, uh, last year, actually Japan approved the first gene edited uh, uh, tomato, uh, which are rich in um, GABA, which is a uh, gamma amino butyric acid. And actually, they, they have uh, this medicinal property because they can fight against the high blood pressure. Um, and also, uh, um, genome additive blight resistant rice actually is approved by USDA and Colombian regulator as non-GMO uh, product. So it has, as I said, it has a lot of potential value uh, because it's relatively accessible, affordable, um, and a, a more public and a small private sector can avail this technology. Quite many uh, new startup companies are using this technology. Um, it can be used uh, 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 even in the, in the developing countries and for, for several crops and trades. Um, and, and, and can address important uh, uh, SDG goals for enhancing global food, nutrition security, uh, mitigating the climate change, 
um, and also supporting more sustainable uh, agriculture system. But in order to see its full potential, there is a need for creating an enabling environment, uh, particularly um, in Africa, uh, with science-based regulatory guidelines for the release and the adoption of the genome edited uh, um, uh, products. Uh, okay, let me go. So there is a quite a lot of going on, like like you know, uh, in Kenya there is a product on Striga tolerant maize. Um, uh, I will talk about banana. There is also um, a virus resistant uh, maize, um, and and uh, there is also some projects going on going on drought drought tolerant maize, and then then also on cassava for the virus tolerance and then disease resistant uh, potato. So there are several projects going on. Um, in many African institutes are already working on it, like in um, starting from Egypt, we are working on wheat. Um, Ethiopia, they are working on uh, teff and, and mustard. Uh, then in Kenya, actually the, uh, quite many projects in Kenya, like in on banana, maize, uh, also sorghum, um, and in Uganda, there is a project on cassava. Uh, Nigeria also, they're working on cassava. Ghana has a, a sweet potato. Um, and in Burkina Faso, actually, they are testing uh, gene-edited uh, rice for the, for the bacterial blight resistant. Um, so just to give you an idea of the global overview of, uh, of legis legislation, so if you see this... Um, 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 and this map, actually, the countries which are shaded in green, these are the countries where the genome edited uh, 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 guidelines are already there. And they, uh, and it says like genome edited crops, if there is no foreign gene integrated in them, uh, they are not regulated as GMOs. So in Africa, actually, there are three countries which has already approved the guidelines. Nigeria was the first, followed by, uh, followed by Kenya, and now uh, uh, Malawi has joined. Uh, them as well. And there are also several other countries where the, it's under discussion, they're, they're shaded in, in yellow. And there are only few countries which actually consider genome edited crops regulated um, as GMOs, like, like in South Africa, uh, in Europe, and, and New Zealand. So now I will quickly give you um, example from banana how this technology can be uh, can be applied for uh, for the disease resistance. So why we are working on banana because banana is uh, one of the major staple food crop, particularly in in Africa, and you know about like one third of the global production of of banana actually comes from Africa, and particularly from the East Africa, which is also the biggest consumer of of banana. But still, there are a lot of problems in banana uh, because of uh, there are several diseases and pests which affects banana production, including like, you know, uh, fungal diseases like black cigatoka, fusarium will. There are pests like nematode weevil. There is bacterial disease and there are also viral diseases. The major problem is actually many of the time these pests and pathogens, uh, they actually coexist. So they are together in the same field. And that's where I think the farmers are facing the biggest challenge. So at at IATA, we have very strong uh, program uh, for the improvement of banana. And we are applying different tools. Um, it's starting from like, you know, selection of the of the resistant varieties, if it is already available uh, in the germplasm. Uh, we have the conventional breeding program, and then we have the biotech program where we use the transgenic as well as the gene editing approach. And our focus is actually to develop the broad spectrum resistance to the various diseases and pests. And we apply those tools based on what is available. So we apply the, the conventional breeding, which is actually is a long, it takes a little bit long time, but it has low cost and there is no regulatory issues with this. Uh, but the conventional breeding is not possible if the trait is not present in the germplasm. For example, if we want to develop the, the uh, uh, bacterial wilt resistance uh, uh, bananas, and if there is no parents which has a resistance to the bacteria will then we cannot develop uh, the uh, the trait into the other other varieties then in that case we go to the to the transgenic approach which is um, 
uh, medium time uh, uh, in comparison to breeding, uh, but it has a high cost. And, and then definitely the biosafety uh, regulation, uh, compliance to the biosafety regulations are required. And in this case, we bring the, 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 the genes from other species or um, uh, mainly we are using the genes from other species, but it can be from the bacteria as well, like Bt, you know. Uh, but uh, then uh, that right now, like, you know, there is a, another tool which is available, which is the gene editing, where we like tweak the genome of the banana itself instead of bringing the, the foreign gene for, for developing the resistance. And this is comparatively shorter and is a low to medium cost and no uh, regulation as like GM are required, but it all also depends upon, upon the different country uh, policies. So at IETA, we started the genome editing uh, in Kenya uh, in, in 2015. Um, and, you know, it started with the development of the tools, and then we started working on various diseases like, like bacterial wilt, um, uh, uh, the banana streak virus, and then recently on, on the fusarium wilt. And our plan is actually to, to start the field trial of this genome additate uh, uh, bananas maybe uh, next year. So for developing the tool, we established the CRISPR-Cas9 based gene editing and uh, both in banana and plantain. And, and we targeted, uh, we used a visual marker uh, called phytoin desaturase. So this PDS, when the PDS is functional, the plants are green. Uh, but if we make this gene non-functional by knocking out using uh, uh, the CRISPR, then actually the plants are albino, as, as you can see in this picture. So we delivered the guide RNA targeting this, uh, this gene um, actually a, a based uh, like in the plasmid based delivery through agrobacterium. So, um, so that's how we established. And then once we had the tool, we started working on banana streak virus. Uh, banana streak virus is a double-stranded uh, uh, DNA, Badna virus, and this virus actually integrates uh, in the banana genome, but it integrates only in the B genome of the, um, of, the, of the banana. So banana comes from like the genome of banana, there are two types of like A genome and the B genome, and banana is, is triploid. And so they can be triple A, it can be AAB, or it can be ABB. So uh, this, B, uh, this, this virus is a problem only in the cultivars, which has B genome, which is mainly the, the plantain. So this virus, the banana streak virus, actually has a monopartite genome. So it has three open reading uh, uh, frames. Open reading frame one and two, they are small, but open reading frame three is a big open reading frame and which encodes a, a polyprotein. And this polyprotein actually gets cleaved by aspartic pro protease, and then it makes the functional uh, proteins. And mainly all the function, all the essential proteins are actually encoded by this open reading frame three. So it has movement protein, coat protein, um, aspartic protease, reverse transcriptase, and RNAs um, H. So the, the virus gets integrated into the banana genome uh, in multiple copies, but it always integrates at a single locus in the B genome. And uh, once it is integrated, a plant doesn't show any symptom. But when plant feels stress and under stress condition, this integrated banana streak virus actually gets activated into this episomal form. And that's when the plant will show the symptom, like, you know, the, as you can see the beautiful yellow streaks here. Um, so this has become uh, a very big challenge uh, for the breeding and also the dissemination of the hybrids because of this, uh, this activation uh, process. And, and the stress can be the environmental stress like drought or or uh, um, um, or it can be even the tissue culture is is a stress for the plant because you know banana is a vegetatively propagated plant so it, it is multiplied through tissue culture and even the hybridization through uh, breeding is also a challenge so this is a this is a very big challenge and and then the another reason that is a challenge is like you know there is a wild type banana called musa balbisiana which has bb genome and you know this 
this wild type, this is also the progenitor of banana and it has resistant to almost all the diseases. But, uh, but then the breeders cannot use this into the breeding program because of the problem of the banana streak virus. So I, I put a strategy to actually inactivate the integrated banana streak virus into the episomal. And the strategy, what I followed was like, you know, if we can target the mutation in all the three open reading frame uh, so that, you know, we can, um, we can make this virus inactive. So we designed the guide RNA targeting open reading frame one, open reading frame two, but in open reading frame three, actually, I targeted the um, aspartic protease because my intention was like you know if I can make the aspartic protease non-functional actually the all the essential proteins will become non-functional because the cleavage will not happen um, in this poly uh, a polyprotein and then we stack these three guides together uh, and 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 actually delivered them into the plant cell so for this work we used uh, a plantain called gonja manjaya which is uh, commonly grown in Uganda. And then first we have characterized this to see, you know, if it has the uh, integration and we found the, the integrated banana streak virus in a multiple copies uh, there. So, so basically when it is in a multiple copies and if you have designed three guide RNA, we are actually sh almost shredding uh, the viral genome, but we are not making any changes to the plant genome. We are only only making the mutation in the viral genome, which is uh, integrated into the into the plant. So after that, we have delivered uh, uh, this into the cell suspension of banana, and then we have regenerated the plantlets, and then we have tested these plantlets uh, to detect uh, the targeted mutation. So we did all the molecular analysis, including um, uh, sequencing. So morphologically, actually, our added plant and the control wild type plants were sim similar. They have no, no changes. And then we got the mutation. So in the open reading frame one and two, because they were small, and so the two guide RNAs were quite close. So if our Cas9 has cut, make the cut simultaneously, we got the big deletion. So we got the deletion of 198 base pairs in this case. But the third guide, uh, because it was it was far from open reading frame one and two targets, so we got a small indels here. After doing the characterization, actually, uh, we potted these plants and then we gave them stress and our stress was we mimic drought. And so this is our control plant. So control plant showed the symptoms uh, like yellow streak virus, uh, uh, the stripe, stripes, but then our 75% of our mutants actually didn't show any symptom at all. But 25% of our mutants actually uh, showed some slight symptoms. Uh, so I was curious to know what was the difference. So like then when we have analyzed uh, our molecular data, notice that the that these these events which didn't show the symptom they had the mutation in the open reading frame three but then the two these two mutants which showed the symptom actually they didn't have any mutation in open reading frame three they had only mutation in orf1 and two um, so this has actually um, uh, you know, uh, my hypothesis actually worked very well, which is like, you know, um, uh, that ORF3 uh, mutation at the aspartic protease actually uh, was very crucial because, uh, you know, this um, ORF3 uh, polyprotein, that's where the whole, all the essential pro uh, proteins are available, which can uh, create the symptoms. So the mutations in aspartic protease should have disrupted the function of the of the protease and and it couldn't cleave to make the other other proteins um, functional so we have now the proof of concept that we can um, uh, inactivate the virus uh, without making any changes in the plant genome and we have actually tested this plants uh, using pcr to confirm that the to confirm the virus load so right now actually so with that what the mutants we got, they are transgenic. And now we are trying to make our final product non-GM. So what we are trying to do is we are actually um, uh, making the mutations in the two parents. One is one of them is 
the 4x hybrid and the second one is the 2x improved parent and then we will cross these parents and segregate out um, our uh, crispr cas reagents which were integrated into the into the plant genome so that our final product the triploid this one will be non gm okay just like in few minutes uh, a quick uh, another example, which is on the banana xanthomonas uh, wilt. This is a, 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 a very serious problem, particularly in the Great Lakes region of the East and Central um, um, Africa on banana. It can lead to the production losses, something between 40 to 80 percent, depending upon the country. And the disease is spread very fast and it leads to the um, uh, complete ill loss because, you know, once the disease is there, uh, the all the plants gets wilted and the and the fruits are rotten so most of the time the farmers doesn't get any produce if the if the disease is there uh, all the cultivated varieties tested are susceptible uh, but we found that the wild type progenitor musa balbisiana uh, has resistance against this disease and there are also some other wild type bananas like musa cuminata subspecies zebrina and benkisai they have also tolerance against uh, this disease um, so overall economic losses because of this disease is high between 2 to 8 billion because once the disease is there there is no other remedy than to uproot all the plants, leave the field fallow for some time, and then, then replanting. And because of this reason, actually, some of the farmers have actually uh, adopted another crops as well. They started growing maize instead of, of banana. Uh, but the countries like, you know, Uganda and, um, and Rwanda, where the consumption of banana is very high, for them, banana is a staple food. You know, the farmers really love growing bananas um, instead of growing uh, a maize. Um, so, so we uh, we thought like, you know, creating resistance in, in these, these bananas uh, will be the best and the most economic uh, solution. So in the past, we used some transgenic approach, but today in my presentation, actually, I'm not going to talk about that. I'll more show you the, the gene editing approach, what we are doing. So what we did was um, uh, we actually studied Musa Balbisiana um, at the molecular level to understand uh, what is uh, why they are how they are developing the resistance against the the, the pathogen? Um, so based on that, we did the comparatively a uh, transcriptome analysis, uh, comparing um, the RNA seq after the infection um, early infection with the pathogen of the Musa balbisiana compared to a susceptible variety, and based on that, we have identified lot of targets for editing. Um, and so we, we identified several susceptibility genes, but we also identified some of the transporter uh, genes um, um, as well, uh, which can be actually knock out to create the, the resistance. So what we are now trying to do is we are getting the information from this wild type uh, banana, progenitor banana, and using it to actually develop the resistance in the susceptible cultivated varieties. Um, we are using two approaches. One is the overexpression of the defense gene. And, and uh, that's where we are using the CRISPR activation. So we are um, activating some of the endogenous um, and defense genes. And the second approach we are using is the knockout of the susceptibility genes. And we are testing uh, several of the susceptibility genes. Um, uh, um, means I will not show the result of this one because it's in quite preliminary stages right now, but we are getting um, very interesting result um, uh, under the glasshouse condition. We are working on almost like eight uh, different uh, targeted genes currently. Um, the second approach we also used was like, you know, identifying uh, the target genes based on the literature. So based on that, we have identified one of the gene called a, a downy mildew uh, resistant DMR6. This is a well-characterized uh, susceptibility 
gene and it gets activated during the host pathogen interaction. So what we saw is in banana, um, uh, the susceptible banana, actually it gets activated up to 60 fold upon infection with, uh, uh, with pathogen. So we have done, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have actually identified the ortholog of DMR6 in banana. And then uh, we have targeted that ortholog to create uh, the genome edited banana. So we have created the edited bananas by targeting the DMR6 ortholog. And so we have regenerated the plant. We have characterized for the targeted uh, mutation. And after that, we, uh, we first tested these plants using the rapid assay. Uh, and these are our controls, which showed the wilted symptom after infection uh, with the pathogen. And these were the mutants. And then further, we have tested uh, these uh, mutants in the glass house. Uh, so this is our mutant and this is the control uh, uh, wild type bananas. And then we have challenged them um, by infecting them with, uh, with xanthomonas, uh, which is uh, xanthomonas campestris pathovarmisosurum, which is causing this bacterial disease. Um, and we didn't find any symptom to these these bananas. We have test uh, these bananas were there after inoculation. For this picture was taken sixty days um, after after inoculation. We also checked on the plant growth, like you know height and the the leaf area, to check if the DMR six uh, knocking out of DMR six has any negative impact on, on banana, and we didn't find um, any negative impact. If you need to uh, need more. I think you can um, read the, it is published, so you can have more details. Uh, one thing which I would like to emphasize, because this is a, a new um, a technology and, you know, so there is a need for building the capacity and as well as, you know, uh, communication, like, you know, communicating the technology and uh, uh, providing the scientific facts um, uh, to the public. Uh, to the regulators and also the research community. So we are heavily involved in actually training people. We organize time to time the editing, the genome editing workshops. We bring even the people to the lab. We give them hands-on training. We are also training PhD students. So uh, I've trained several students there. Um, and, and then, you know, we are providing um, uh, how to communicate the gene editing. So we are also providing those type of uh, training courses. We are working with, with, with different partners in that. And, you know, recently, um, uh, like starting next year in January, we are organizing uh, a training course, which is a, a one year uh, course. We are working very closely with UC Davis. We are partnering with UC Davis and, uh, and Nepad and, um, and UC Barclay there. And this course will be actually in our lab in Kenya and, and uh, the different like 20 students will come uh, and, and get hands-on training um, in our lab uh, of, in one year time. And then we will run maybe the second batch. Our intention is to train actually 80 to 100 um, African scientists in genome editing uh, all across, across Africa. Uh, so in summary, uh, genome editing tools um, are becoming quite popular molecule tool of choice, not only for uh, crop improvement, but also for the functional genomics. And among them, CRISPR has uh, become as the most popular technique, maybe because it is uh, simple, um, efficient, um, very specific, and you know you can multiplex. You can multiplex the trait, as I was showing you. You know we have multiplex different guide RNA, like you know three guide RNA together. In our lab, actually, we can multiplex up to six together, and and it's very easy to adapt. What you require is a reference genome of the crop species you are interested in, the plant transformation protocol, uh, bioinformatic tools, and the regulatory framework in the country where you are working on. Um, it's very important to understand the type of genome editing so that you know you can distinguish between, um, uh, like you know whether it needs to be regulated as GMOs or not. Uh, GM, uh, genome edited crops with no foreign gene integration are not regulated as GMOs in several countries. Um, and, and the application of CRISPR-Cas based genome editing has been demonstrated in over 40 crops now, um, including, including bananas. So in the end, I would like to acknowledge my team 
uh, my plant transformation team, the bioinformatics team, and also our partners at the uh, University of California uh, and Alliance for Science, and also the financial support from USAID and the CGIR research program. So uh, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any question. Thanks.